with that, um, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. James Price and Dr. Marianne Zuringer, um, who are core members of um, the um, Energy Systems team uh, here, at the, here at the UCL um, um, Energy Institute. Um, both of them have co-developed the high-res model, which we will uh, talk about um, in detail. And uh, both of their um, research is really looking at uh, a, a, a large-scale penetration of renewable energy and how you model the spatial and temporal um, aspects of that. Um, that's the subject that, that Marianne's PhD was in, a uh, joint PhD from Utrecht University and Bochum University in Vienna. Uh, James's PhD is in physics, it's something that I don't understand, but he's used those, those uh, skills to, um, to, to um, enter the energy field. Uh, just uh, a little bit more on both of them. Prior to working at UCL, uh, Marianne has worked both at uh, YASA in Austria, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, and also the Joint uh, Research Centre of the European Commission. Um, and James has been an environmental consultant and worked uh, for the um, Hadley Centre at the Met Office. So really a, a very broad set of skills that they have. Um, their topic title is Ambitious, Planning Low Carbon Electricity Systems for Great Britain in 2050. Um, super topical, super interesting, um, and I'm really interested to hear what they have to say. So please, James and Marianne, the floor is yours. So um, I'm gonna, or James and I are going to present work on planning low carbon electricity systems for GB in 2050. That's work we've conducted over the last um, few years as part of the Wholesome project, and it has been done in collaboration with HR um, at UCL Energy Institute and Andy Moore, and Dennis um, Conado and Senaido Sobral at Cambridge University. So some of their results are also um, shared results um, with them. Um, I'm going to introduce. Um, give you a bit of background, then we introduce our modeling framework and two case study that we have been um, conducting. So what's the motivation for our work? So it's um, both um, international emission reduction targets, um, the Paris Agreement, um, we want to find out how can the U UK do its bit um, for, um, for reaching the Paris Agreement, and then the UK Climate Change Act, um, which has as target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 80% relative to 1990 levels um, by 2050. And as you can see here in the graph, um, here's um, years um, and emissions, um, and the different colors represent different sectors. Um, so you can see most of the emission reductions have been driven by the power sector, which is largely due to um, shutting down the coal power plants in the UK. Um, transport and buildings, however, have been increasing um, in green transport and grey buildings um, over the last couple of years. And the uh, Committee of Climate Change um, um, talks about actually missing um, the, the Climate Change Act. Here you can see the emissions tra trajectory which we should pursue um, until 2032 um, and where we are currently um, if we look at um, we take into consideration current government policies. So in our research um, we want to investigate I want to contribute, how can we close this policy gap and how can we um, actually achieve um, the target set by the Climate Change Act. I talked about the importance of the electricity sector, so it currently accounts for 24% of greenhouse gas emissions um, with 340 terawatt hours um, of annual demand in 2016. And if you think about decarbonizing other sectors, um, we have a total final energy consumption um, of 1,600 terawatt hours. So if we do not decarbonize the electricity sector, but um, electrify heat and transport, um, demand and emissions could rise substantially. The decarbonization of the electricity sector is a low-hanging fruit. Um, the options are commercially available and amongst um, the lowest ones to reach um, a decarbonized energy system. What are the options available to decarbonize the electricity sector? So we have um, nuclear. This is Team TC, um, which has been given the green light the UK government with a strike price of um, 93 pounds per megawatt hour. Then we have um, carbon capture and storage. Um, however, the government is quite uncertain how this will feature in a future low carbon energy system as the government um, had cancelled um, the, the um, carbon capture and storage price in 2015. And then we have renewables. That's actually a headline from today. Um, so the UK built half of Europe's offshore wind power in 2017, which was um, around 1.6 gigawatt, I think, yeah. Um, so a, a, very, a very big amount. 
And um, wh why has, is, is offshore wind so successful? So the cost of very renewable energy technologies, which in the UK are mainly wind and solar, have been decreasing dramatically. You can see here the price um, of solar panels between um, 2010 and 2016 has been going down um, from around I mean, three um, US dollar per watt um, down to um, less than one. Um, similarly, if we look at um, auction prices um, for premium tariffs or contract for differences annually, um, averages also for solar in yellow, this has been going down um, from 300, around $300 um, dollars per megawatt hour down to um, less than $50 um, per megawatt hour um, for um, capacities coming um, of being commissioned in 2020. Wind has been going down um, from 100 um, also to around $50 per megawatt hour. And the UK government predicts PV and offshore wind to be the cheapest form of electricity generation in 2020, um, with offshore wind following soon after. This was also shown by the recent um, contract for difference um, allocation round, where strike prices as low as 57 um, pounds per megawatt hour um, were achieved. And those are the two, um, two um, farms which are going to be delivered in 2022. The first phase, um, so Murray third, and Hornsey Project two, um, which will have um, a joint capacity of around 2.5 gigawatt. Thanks, Ariana. So we've uh, heard a lot about how the costs of renewables are dropping, um, but I thought I'd just give you a little bit of perspective uh, about what they look like right now in the uh, UK's power sector. So what I'm plotting here uh, on the y-axis is the share of uh, renewables and uh, coal um, in the UK's uh, um, electricity generation from the Bayes Energy Trends data set. And this is from 2006 to uh, 2016, so it's the last decade uh, or so. And what we see in this case is that renewables started from a very low base at around 2% and has since uh, um, been rising up to about 14 or 15%, depending on the weather in each year. And at the same time, coal, uh, which was uh, peaking at around 40%, has been coming right down. Now, as Marianne mentioned, that's largely because of the uh, closure of some coal plants to do with the carbon price floor rising and also um, some air quality standards from the, uh, from the EU. And indeed, I'm sure you, you may have heard that last year was the first year for over 100 years where there was a 24-hour period where coal wasn't featuring at all on the UK's electricity system, um, which is quite a, a uh, standout change for its uh, prospects. Okay, so as of the end of 2016, we had 16 gigawatts of wind installed in the UK, uh, 11 gigawatts of offshore and 5 gigawatts of onshore. We've had 12 uh, gigawatts of solar PV pretty much installed since about 2011 or 2010, so in just six or seven years, we installed 12 gigawatts of solar PV. And to, together, in 2016, these were generating 48 terawatt hours of electricity from a, from a total generation of 339, so that's about 14%. So that's where we're at right now, 14% share of electricity generation. But going forward, uh, the technical potential for variable renewables in the UK is substantial. Now I emphasize I'm talking about technical potential here. I'm not talking about social acceptance or public acceptance or any limits like that. But the technical potential, uh, which I've split into capacity potential, which is how, much, how many panels and turbines you could build, and the generation potential in terawatt hours per year. So here for onshore wind, we're looking at 300 uh, gigawatts or more onshore, giving you about 750 terawatt hours a year. Sorry. Um, for offshore, it could be, or it, it would be greater than 600 gigawatts, and even more if we were able to take advantage of floating wind turbines. Um, so that's 600 gigawatts, roughly out to a depth of about 60 or 70 meters, which is about as deep as the bottom-mounted offshore turbines go at the moment. But as I say, floating would give us access to even more capacity, and that leads to around. 2,000 terawatt hours a year, depending on the capacity factors that the farms would get, of course. And for solar, again, probably greater than 500 gigawatts, giving us around 400 terawatt hours a year. Now, added together, that's uh, roughly double the uh, amount of final energy consumption that Mariana was just talking about, 1,600 terawatt hours a year in 2016. And again, some of these are actually quite conservative, depending on how deep we can go, etc. So we've got some big numbers there, but I emphasize these are technical potentials. They are not real world necessarily, because of course, social acceptance shapes 
a lot of things. But there are some key questions. So the costs are coming down, there's a lot of potential. One of the key questions that we're interested in is how best to manage VRE intermittency or the variability that gets talked about in the media a great deal. So this plot um, comes from a tutorial that I give here at UCL. Uh, and what I'm plotting here is capacity factor um, against uh, hours. So this is a 100 hour time series. And these are time series for uh, wind in Cornwall and solar. Uh, yeah, sort of wind in Cornwall and solar in Cornwall, and then wind and solar in Scotland. Uh, you, hopefully you can see the colours, but basically uh, the point here is that this blue line, which is wind in Cornwall, there are times where it reaches zero capacity factor, um, and then there are times when it's up at 50%. And then indeed for wind in Scotland, there are times when it reaches zero capacity factor. So, of course, if we were only relying on wind in one of those regions, we might be in trouble because we wouldn't be generating any electricity. Um, and the same is true for solar. There, there are periods of time at night where solar is not generating at all. But what you'll note is if you add all those lines together, there is no time across this 100-hour period where we reach zero capacity factor. There is no time where we're not generating anything. So this is two of the key routes to integrating renewables into the system. You can spatially spread them out, spatially diversify, and you can also technologically diversify. So you take in a take into account the fact that you can deploy in different places, which gives you different timings of production based on the weather there, and also you can mix different technologies together that, that have different production profiles. So that's, that's one way or two ways you can manage uh, the variability of renewables. You can also use storage, of course, and I'm sure many of you are aware of that. Uh, you can link with, the, uh, with, the, um, with Europe uh, through interconnection, and you can also have uh, demand-side measures that may seek to reduce peak demand. So that's uh, some of the key options to manage that. And as I've just talked about, we've, we, um, we've got a lot of technical potential in the UK for renewables, but um, what about social acceptance? So this spinning turbine here is taken from the Campaign Against Rural Exploitation, which is a, a cam campaign group in Cornwall uh, that was campaigning against a specific uh, onshore wind development. And when you land on their website, the first thing you see is this 100 or 100. 10 meter high turbine spinning next to the village church. Now, if, if you're somebody in that area and you go to that website, you're gonna see that, and that's quite, uh, that's quite emotive, that's, that's gonna scare you. Um, and so that's the kind of uh, picture. There are some places um, where uh, there's quite low social acceptance for renewables. And that leads to, um, just an example here, the white areas would be where you wouldn't be uh, allowed to build renewables. The black areas are where may, maybe you would be able to deploy onshore wind. So it's not as clear cut as that technical potential picture uh, made it look. But luckily energy models can help. So why do we use energy models? Well, at their core, they're all about trying to figure out how we go from the high uh, carbon energy system that we have right now and we transition to a low carbon energy system at some stage in the future. And at UCL, we've spent the last four years as part of the Holson project uh, developing um, the UK government's principal long-term energy system model, UK Times, or UKTM. And it's been used by the UK government to underpin the Carbon Budget 5 analysis that some of you may be aware of, and also the Clean Growth Strategy. Um, and UKTM is a cost optimising, so it minimises cost, or it tries to minimise cost, a uh, long time horizon model of the whole energy system. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is it covers all of the important sectors in the energy system, and it can trade off mitigation in those sectors against one another. So if you place this target, the 80% GHG cut that Mariana talked about, on the model, it can then figure out which sector to decarbonize first, second, third, and how to do it. And it, and it works according to this schematic here. You've got demands coming in from over here. These are exogenous, exogenously set demands driven by GDP and population and the number of households. And then we've got some primary resources over here as well as imports. And essentially what the model does is it figures out how to configure the energy system to go from primary resources to these end use demands. And in doing so, it tracks emissions, uh, prices, and also the costs of achieving that. So that's how UK Times works. So we've seen that it's got a great long-term view uh, and a multi-sector view as well, but it comes with some necessary compromises. It's a single region model and its temporal, resolu its temporal resolution leads to a simplified representation of renewables. So the whole thinking behind this was there, well, we need to develop a high spatial and temporal resolution model, which we did, uh, and that's where high res came in. 
um, and it complements UK, uh, UKTM's long-term holistic perspective. So what does high res do? It matches uh, hourly electricity supply and demand for one snapshot year. So it doesn't take into account this 2010 to 2050 horizon. It's just looking at one snapshot year at 8,760 hour resolution for Great Britain. And it tries to do this at least cost. And it chops Great Britain up into these 20 zones that you can see here. Um, and it also then has a simplified representation of the transmission system, uh, which is these red lines that hopefully you can make out so that allows the model to decide to build uh, renewables in one place and move the energy uh, or the electricity down to where it's being demanded. And the model decides on how much and where to build generation, uh, storage and transmission to achieve that task of supply and demand balancing. And it does that, as I said, at least cost, but subject to a variety of constraints. <coughs> For instance, uh, limits on uh, annual CO2 emissions, and also technical limits on what the transmission system can handle and what the generators can achieve in terms of how fast they can turn on and off. So that's high res Now the core aim of high res as I, I hopefully have made clear, is to capture the variability of uh, variable renewables in time and space. Um, this is the, 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 the spatial resolution of the weather data that goes into high res to power its solar and wind generation. These grid cells are about half a degree by half a degree, and each one of those grid cells has a time series of onshore wind and solar, or offshore wind over here. And so the model can decide whether it deploys a certain amount of capacity in one of those cells, and then the time series tell it how much it would generate from that. And this GIF uh, that's running on the right-hand side, uh, this is an example of the historical weather data that we use to power the model, or to power renewables in the model. Um, and this is two days from 2010. Um, and the key point is that the, the, the uh, blue cells are low capacity factors, the red cells are high capacity factors. And what you'll see is that there's not much wind and then a, a low pressure system comes in and that gives us lots of high capacity factors across Great Britain for a few hours. And then that low pressure system moves away and then it's replaced by quite slack conditions. So that gives you an idea of the fidelity of the weather data that's gone in to drive the model. And we do the same for offshore wind and the same for solar. So it, it has this hourly uh, grid cell level resolution weather data. Um, so that's high res in a nutshell. I'll hand back over to Lauren. Um, so before I start explaining you the first case study, I'll just um, show you here our modeling framework. So James already said that we use UKTM. Um, and we use it um, to give us the electricity system boundaries for, the, for a year that we're interested in, mostly 2050, because that is um, when um, the target is in place. And um, electricity system boundaries, I, I mean, um, we use um, annual electricity demand from UPTM, it's an energy system model. It also tells us which sectors get electrified. And we also use um, the total carbon emissions that are placed on the electricity sector from UPTM. Again, as a total energy system model, it tells us how much um, of, from the, of the burden um, decarbonization and it's based on the, on the electricity sector. And um, James already talked about um, the constraints that are placed on the siting of renewable energy technologies. So again, um, here we do some GRS modeling always first to tell us in a given zone or given location um, what area is actually um, suitable for the deployment of um, renewable energy technologies based on social, environmental, and technical restrictions. And all that we feed into the high-risk model, which designs um, the least cost power system. And James already talked about it. It then gives us, um, tells us how much and where to place um, generation um, capacities, but also integration options. So where to extend the transmission grid, where to place storage, and where to place flexible generation. And we get other um, insights as well, as, such as total system costs, total emissions. Um, so I'll, I'll now introduce our first case study. So which is um, titled Designing Low Carbon Power Systems that are robust to the spatial, temporal, and interannual variability of weather. James already said um, that weather changes spatially, so one location is windier, but also from hour to hour. Um, and what most studies, however, do not look at, that weather changes also from year to year. This is taken from a publication from, from Stefan Fenninger. You can see here, he um, shows um, using 25 weather years he shows um, how um, the weather, the daily mean um, capacity factors um, vary. So you can see very large uh, variations 
on top for PV and here um, for wind energy for 25 years. And um, we, we've been talking about studies, energy models being used for policy making, but these studies um, actually always um, average over multiple years or only use single weather years. So that they neglect this interannual weather variability that you can see and which is really uh, very strong. So they assume that every year has the same weather. So here we want to look for the first time what actually happens if you use um, several weather years to design your electricity system. Do the results really change or does it not matter? Can you continue using um, single weather years even if um, we have increasing share of renewables, so an increasing weather dependency in our uh, electricity system? So I said already, um, the aim of the study is to look at what's the impact um, on costs, emission, and system design when we capture this interannual weather variability. I will present um, several results. So we are going to look at are the system costs and emissions different when we use um, many weather years? Are the capacities of integration options different when we use many weather years? Um, are the renewables and integration options located in different places when we use many weather years? And what then happens if we actually do what most studies do, if you plan the system based on a single weather year? What happens then if, like in re real life, we have um, several, every um, year has a different weather? Um, we look at two different scenarios, so a 50% generation of from um, variable renewable energy technologies, so from um, solar and wind, and an 80% um, generation from variable renewable energy um, sources. So this allows us then to really see um, what, what happens, is, does it get more important, um, this internal variability, when we move to um, systems with higher shares of renewables. <coughs> and then also we differ between two um, VOE integration option scenarios, one where we allow um, the, the system to invest in the, our three integration options, so flexible generation, storage, and transmission grid extension. And then because James talked about social acceptance issues and th they are very strong when um, looking at transmission grid extension. So in the second case, we do not allow the model to invest in transmission grid extension. So we say the model can only um, invest into storage and flexible generation. And then as I said, we, we look at what happens if you plan the system based on single weather years, or if you plan it based on um, a large number of weather years. So in this case, based on the variability of 10 weather years. Um, so first, I'm already go, um, looking at results. The first one is the total system um, costs. So we call them system LCOE, um, system levelized cost of electricity. So here you can see the 50% share and the 80% share case. Um, and the box plots um, represent the variability in costs. Um, so at the 50% variability share, you have some variability, um, but this increases much more um, when you go into higher shares of renewables. So then the variability, um, depending on the weather year, between 100 um, pounds um, per megawatt hour going up to um, 125 um, pounds per megawatt hour. Similar when we look at emissions, so this is emissions, again we see a um, large spread um, in emissions um, when using different weather years. Um, so here we see different weather years matter in terms of costs and, and increasingly so when moving to higher shares of renewables. Um, now I want to look at how do the capacities of integration options change when we use different weather years. Um, in orange, there's an amount of capacity um, for flexible generation. So here in the <coughs> gigawatts for the 50 VOE and the 80 VOE scenario, here's the amount of storage and here's the amount of transmission. Again, you see um, variability increasing um, at higher shares of renewables. And if you look here at the different weather years that we use, so if you use weather year from 2001 to 2010, you can see um, how much capacity is installed per weather year. So you can see, um, it really depends on the weather year, what the optimal capacity of flexible generation and the optimal capacity of storage is. Um, it actually changes plus minus 40% depending on the weather year. Transmission grid extension in blue here is a bit less variable <coughs> because the model really likes transmission grid extension as it can take advantage of the much better capacity factors, um, for example, north um, in Scotland, but also can it take advantage that in different locations um, the production 
uh, happens at different times. So it likes the spatial diversification that it can gain from transmission grid extension. So it's less weather sensitive transmission grid extension, but the model likes it very much, so it increases it up to 70% um, more than what we have currently um, in the system. So also for um, the optimal amount of capacities for integration options to interannual annual weather variability, so the weather year that we're using to design the system matters. Um, then now I, I'm looking at where are integration options located and when using different weather years. Um, so here is flexible generation and storage and transmission grid. Um, this is zone 1.1 1 .1 that James introduced going down to zone 17. So this is Scotland going down and here's the southwest um, of England. And yeah, here you can see London, zone 14. So you can see most of the flexible generation consistently over the weather years. I mean, the exact amount um, depends on the year. But we know consistently you can say it's all installed um, where demand is located. Similar picture for storage. So storage is located where demand um, is located. And another consistent picture that is independent of the weather year is that the model moves the electricity down from um, Scotland down to where the demand is. So it, needs, it, it likes extending the transmission grid um, between um, Scotland down to England. <coughs> yeah, set flexible generation storage consistently placed around the demand centers and transmission grid consistently used to move electricity from north to south. So those are consistent pictures that we can see independent of the weather year. Renewables, they are located, there are also some consistent patterns. So you can see solar energy mainly in the south, um, as can be expected. Wind energy is placed around the country um, because as I said, the model likes uh, to take advantage of different times of production, but they're also outliers. So you can see in some weather years, the model tells us it's cost optimal to install um, solar energy, quite a considerable amount um, in Scotland. So if you only use that weather year, we would think that um, to place a lot of um, solar energy in the north, which um, is not in, um, it's inconsistent with actually the general um, pattern that we see. And the last result I'm going to show you is, um, we now found these consistent patterns and inconsistent patterns, um, and we now want to look at what actually happens if we plan the system based on the design of one weather year. So what most studies do, they use one weather year which gives you a system design. And so we fix the system design based on one weather year and run it with all other weather years. And let's look at the right side. So this is the 80% case because it's stronger, because it's more weather dependent. So the 80% um, URE case, so 80% of um, generation comes from renewables. Here you can see the percentage of hours where um, demand is not met. So where demand and supply do not match. So you can see in that 80% um, case, fixing the system design um, based on one weather year and running with the other weather years, you, can, you get um, more than 5% of the hours um, have um, an unmet demand. And this can increase up to 33 gigawatt. So really um, a high amount of unmet demand um, if, we base, if we plan based on one weather year. Um, and this is really important insight because if you plan based on one weather year, we can get a system that doesn't, where supply and demand do not match. Um, what one, another interesting thing is here, some of the hours where there's unmet demand actually um, due to the emissions constraint. So there are hours when the system is not allowed to run um, its gas and generation because it reaches um, the emission limit that is set by, by the UK Times model. So both planning for one weather year might lead to systems that are um, operationally inadequate but also fail to meet long-term emission reduction targets. So the policy insights from this study are that it's really important using more than one weather year because otherwise we consistently underestimate cost of emission <coughs> and we get results which are operationally inadequate, so where supply and demand do not match, and we can fail to meet carbon targets. And that, that yeah, leads us to the second study. Thanks, okay, so I'm gonna talk you through page 32, which again is looking at the GB power system in 2050, but this time, from an energy, uh, land, and water perspective. 
And what we wanted to do here really is to have a look at those important non-cost restrictions, as we call them, on our lease cost uh, power systems with 50% uh, and 80% <coughs> shares of renewables. Um, so again, we took uh, 2050 electricity demand, annual demand, and CO2 emissions from UK Times and fed those into high-res to restrict them, to give them the electricity system boundaries that, that high-res had to stay within. And what kind of restrictions am I talking about? Well, we've talked a lot about um, the uh, social acceptance of renewables, and so that's a key factor. Uh, if you look at the Bayes Attitude Tracker for renewables at the national level, there's a lot of support for them. But if you look at uh, um, local case studies, there will be some significant amounts of opposition. But this is uh, what we call our social acceptance limits. Um, and we also uh, have the fact that renewables can come into conflict with other environmental and conservation goals. So we've got these social, environmental, and some technical restrictions that affect where we can site our renewables. And that those are actually uncertain, of course, because they depend on the attitudes of people. How far away from our households do we want renewables to be deployed? And how much do we care about our national parks or our sites of uh, other sites of conservation? So that was what we looked at for renewables. For nuclear, um, there's a lot of uncertainty going forward about exactly how nuclear or, or how much nuclear will feature in the UK power <coughs> system. But one thing we know at the moment, anyway, is that following a debt review in 2011, there's only eight uh, actual sites where nuclear can be built or planned to be built uh, in the UK at the moment. And these are all uh, legacy sites, so they're sites where nuclear was currently deployed. Um, and they're all on the coast. And so we wanted to reflect that in our model and also reflect the uncertainty about exactly how big a role nuclear will play going forward. And then finally, we were, we were interested in um, gas with CCS, and we were trying to think about uh, the restrictions on that, um, where that may be cited. Uh, and the main restriction that we looked at here was future water availability for power station cooling. So whether they'll be using fresh or seawater being the particular constraint that we were looking at. And the aim of this study then was to capture these restrictions in high res uh, using three plausible scenarios for each, a low, a medium, and a high case, and then see how that affects the results coming out of the model in terms of system costs and design. So just to dive straight in with the, uh, the land restrictions uh, for renewables, uh, what I'm showing at the top is the low and the high restrictions. I won't show any of the medium restrictions just for simplicity's sake. Um, this is PV, onshore wind, and offshore wind. So in the low case, uh, so in this case, just to confuse you from that first slide I showed, the dark area is <coughs> the way you... wouldn't be able to build renewables. The light areas are where the model would decide or could be uh, allowed to build renewables. 
Um, so if you look at PV, for instance, this is ground-mounted PV. We're excluding London. We're excluding some national parks. Uh, but there's actually quite large areas of the country where um, the model would be allowed to deploy renewables. And the same for onshore wind and offshore wind. Some of these lines, those are shipping lanes. So really busy shipping lanes we've excluded. You can't build them at all. Um, but the, it's got large areas out here in the North Sea where it can deploy. Uh, but then the high case is quite a bit more restricted, as you would expect. Um, here, there's large areas of, uh, of, um, of GB where you wouldn't be able to build solar PV. And that might be, for instance, because the agricultural land is grade one or two, which are the, the best grades of agricultural land, and you wouldn't want panels built on them. Uh, so we've restricted uh, solar PV based on those kind of criteria. Onshore wind, this actually receives the most aggressive restrictions because we're trying to capture the kind of social acceptance that we see today for onshore wind. So, for instance, we say that you can't build a turbine within 10 kilometres of any settlement. And that wipes out most of uh, the um, mainland GB. Not all of it. You can see some white bits of it up there. Uh, and then for offshore wind, um, again, we've been quite restrictive. We've taken into account some of the marine conservation zones. You can't build in them. And there's some other factors got that have gone into that as well. And then we aggregate all the technologies together, so PV, onshore wind, solar, uh, sorry, PV, onshore wind, and offshore wind, and then we create a low for all renewables and a high for all renewables. So they move together when we, when we move up the land constraint levels. So, th so now on to nuclear. Uh, I talked about those eight legacy sites. Um, there's a cons uh, there's, there's some, some work that we've done as part of UKTM that says there may well be a future where we could deploy up to 31 uh, gigawatts of nuclear. So what we've done is we've taken uh, 31 gigawatts of nuclear as our low restriction and we've distributed those out over the eight legacy sites um, that I talked about earlier. And then on the high end, we've been very restrictive. We've said to the model uh, that we'll finish building Hinkley C um, by 2050. I hope that's the case. Uh, and then all other plants that are operational today will have closed in line with their closing dates around the uh, mid-2020s up to 2030s, and then no, no further new nuclear gets built. So, we've got, so we essentially let the model build somewhere between 3.2 and 31 gigawatts of nuclear. So that's our high to low constraint here. Uh, and now for the water restriction, it's a bit more complicated. So we split fresh water and seawater up. Um, what I'm showing you here <coughs> is the percentage change in the availability of fresh water for power station cooling relative to 2010 figures in each zone. So that's what the color bar, so that's percentage, um, and that's what the color bar is showing. And what is behind all this is um, a climate change future that is actually quite positive for the availability of fresh water in GB, and also some, uh, some other anthropogenic demands for water that are also quite positive. So population growth is perhaps quite muted. So that gives us our positive picture where there's a lot of fresh water available for the model to use. And we've also said to the model that you can have as much seawater as you want in any of the zones with coast. So that's our low restriction. Our high restriction, we've done the opposite. We've picked a pessimistic climate change scenario, the most pessimistic one that we could find from the environment agency work that this is based on. And uh, that then leads to a, a decrease in freshwater availability for power station cooling of around somewhere between 30 to 50% by um, 2050. And we said uh, that the model is unable to um, build any seawater cooled uh, natural gas with CCS in uh, England and Wales. And to do this, we added some cooling technologies to the model. Um, I'm only just pointing this out because they will crop up in, in some slides I'm just going to show in a moment. So we've got, the key thing to remember here is that there's this, this once through or OT, it's got low cost but high water use. And air has got a high cost but a low water use, pretty much no water use. So, so this allows the model to play off um, costs against water use. So as it gets more and more restricted, the model can opt for less water demanding technologies, but they tend to cost more. So they will have an impact on system costs and therefore um, prices that consumers would see, probably. Okay, so diving into some results, um, these cubes look a little bit bamboozling to start with. Uh, this is the levelized cost of electricity. Again, this is the system cost. So this is essentially how expensive the system is divided by the total demand, demand that the system has had to meet for a year. And what I'm plotting here is uh, a cube because we've got three axes. We've got land along this axis, 
nuclear along this axis from low to high, and water along this axis from low to high. So this is trying to represent the three scenario dimensions. And the color bar, the color of these circles, uh, tells us, um, or disks rather, tells us what the levelized cost of the system is. So if we start over here, where we're putting the lowest level of restrictions on the system, the lowest land restrictions, water, and nuclear restrictions, uh, the model starts at around 81 pounds per megawatt hour. And then what we can do is we can try and look to see which dimension is the most significant in terms of cost um, and therefore uh, has the largest impact. Um, and if we slide along each one of these axes from low and just taking each one up at a time, up from low to high, we can see which dimension is the most important. And what you'll hopefully see, I hope the colours are clear, is that nuclear ends up being the most important initial dimension. It leads to a jump from around £81 per megawatt hour up to about 87 ish so that's a 6 or 7% cost increase just from restricting ourselves from 31 gigawatts of nuclear down to NPC. Uh, then if we slide along the land axis, from, uh, so we're, we're here now, we've slided along the land axis, then the system cost jumps up right up to here. So that's a 10% increase from restricting our land that the model can <coughs> use to deploy renewables. And predominantly what most of that comes from is onshore wind. Uh, the model likes onshore wind because it's cheap. Uh, it's the cheapest form of power generation in the model uh, by 2050, but if you restrict it from deploying it in total capacity terms and also to the best sites, that leads to uh, large cost implications for the system. And then finally, if you crank water up to high, we're looking at a 25% cost increase just from turning our restrictions up. And uh, the 80% VRE share, so this is a 50% VRE share, this is an 80% share, it gives us a similar picture, uh, but now things are slightly reversed. The, the initial dimension that matters the most is land, and that's predictable, really, because the system is depending that much more on renewables, and you're restricting uh, the land a lot going from low to high. And so that leads, uh, leads us to have a cost jump from about 86 down here up to, I can't even see what colour that is, 95. So that's a 10 or 11% cost increase just from restricting onshore wind, really. So that's how it looks in LCOE terms. Now, uh, these stacked bar plots, they, they, they look a bit crazy, but I'll take you through them. Uh, we've got uh, all of the generation options that are in the model uh, along the top in different colours. Hopefully the colours come through okay. We've got the generation in terawatt hours along the y-axis, and then the x-axis is just the scenario dimensions. It's those corner points of the cube, and this is the least cost case again, so it's our 50% share of renewables. We've got our land, nuclear, and water restrictions. L means low, H means high. Hopefully that's clear. If we start over here, uh, the key takeaway points is when we're, we have low restrictions, the model will deploy about 40-45% nuclear ge uh, generation. So again, as I say, this is share of generation. Renewables are about 50-55%. to 55%, And there's a small amount of natural gas uh, with CCS, which is being called by seawater there. And that's really just serving to balance the renewables. It's there to, to, to pick up the gap when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Then as we increase our constraints, uh, if we just move from low to high on the water dimension, the model has to switch to some air cooling, which is that light orange, and it has to switch to some closed loop cooling, which is evaporative cooling, basically it's cooling towers. So the model moves from once through cooling to this uh, more water efficient option, but it costs more. And that in part accounts for why we've seen some of the cost increases that we have seen. Um, if we restrict nuclear, the model rapidly, so in this case here, we've restricted nuclear up to only Hinkley C, and the model has to fill in a lot of offshore wind to compensate for that. And also it starts to use a little bit more storage as well. And then the final point I just want to make from this is that if we ramp all the way from low up to high, what you'll see is offshore wind comes in dramatically. Onshore wind is being heavily constrained by that land constraint that I showed you at the start. And the model is starting to use a lot more storage. And what that's saying to us is, is if we restrict onshore wind, the model can't uh, also deploy to some of the better sites. It's less spatially optimal. It can't spread the renewables out as much as it would like. And it's less te technologically optimal because we've restricted onshore wind. It has to start using things like storage to compensate for that. So the policy insights that we've taken from this is that these important non-cost restrictions, they can have large cost impacts on this 2050 power system. Together, they can lead to, uh, if we go from the all-low case to the all-high case, 25% um, more system costs in a, in a worst versus best case. And we've seen that these onshore wind limits, they can have a sizable uh, system cost impact, uh, up to about 
best versus worst case. Because that technology is cheap, and also because uh, the land restrictions limit its access to the best sites, um, the, the best being the most cost-effective sites. We've seen as well that nuclear is important. Uh, it can lead to up to 17% uh, cost increase relative to the best case if you restrict the model's access to more nuclear than just simply C. But there is this ongoing uncertainty, I want to stress that, um, about cost and time overrun. So you may have seen in the media recently, there's a lot of coverage about the fact that the Hinkley C design is being built in Finland and France uh, by EDF and that uh, those projects have seen quite significant cost and time overruns. So if the cost of uh, nuclear turns out to be higher than, than the um, numbers that we've had in the model, there could well be a different picture for how important nuclear is. Um, we've seen that uh, this gas CCS has a secondary role uh, because of the emissions constraints on the power sector in 2050. Um, things are quite strict, and even though it's capturing its carbon, it only captures about 50 grams of CO2 per megawatt hour, uh, per kilowatt hour even. Um, and 50 grams of CO2 is still too much um, by the time we get to 2050, at least in this version from uh, taking those numbers from UKTM. And then finally, uh, we've seen that storage is increasingly important as land for renewables is limited. It's there to compensate for the fact that we can't get this optimal mix of um, spatial deployment <coughs> and technology. So finally, I just wanted to touch on some future research. I talked a lot, or we've talked a lot about social acceptance, and we want to try to strengthen that a bit. Uh, what we want to do is bring together our energy modeling with some social science approaches, some participatory approaches, surveys, focus groups, things like that, to try and get an empirically grounded picture of what social acceptance really looks like in the UK, quantified, and then we can put it into the model to repeat the kind of exercise uh, that we've just shown you, which was largely based on literature data um, and just testing out what might happen. So we'd, we'd, we'd like to get some empirically grounded data for that. And then from a technical perspective, we want to bring together energy modeling and climate science. Uh, because the model depends a lot on weather, um, and we know the weather's going to change if climate change plays out. So if we're looking at these highly weather-dependent energy systems, we, we want to know how future climate affects it, not just historical climate, because we, right now we use historical weather data. It would be nice to know what the uh, weather in 2050 or 2100 would um, lead to our model and, and, and how it would design systems that can cope with the, that, those kind of uh, weather conditions. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you both. I've, I've covered um, a huge amount of ground. I'm sure there'll be a number of questions. Um, we have two people to answer. So what I might try to do is get two questions. And we already have a question at the front. Do we have another? So we have, so we have two questions here to start with, and then I'll, I'll go to the back of the room. If you could say who you are, and a perfect question is a concise question. <laughs> Ken Neal, um, you didn't, uh, or you haven't taken any account of title. No. So, oh, 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 title question. I'm a good next question. I'll, 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 I'll give more. Was there any reason? Okay, so hold that question, please. Hi, uh, Matthew Smith. Um, you, you, you discussed the, um, the the price reduction and the, the, the costs rather in, in renewables. What do you attribute that to? And if it's made for cheap imports from the east, is that sustainable with a lower spending? Okay. Okay, so um, tidal energy, we actually have a study that only deals with um, the integration of marine technologies, looking specifically with tidal. Um, here, because it's not one of the technologies that um, we know it will feature heavily, so that was the reason why we didn't include it, I would say. Yeah, well, I, I mean, right, right now, the, the future for tidal or tidal lagoon, if, if that's the one that looks like it's perhaps could be the most promising, um, it's still quite costly and it's it's quite uncertain. It would be something that we're quite interested in looking at in the future, but um, right now wind and solar are very established, they're at scale um, and they're quite cheap and that tends to be, you know, those issues tend to be some of the key driving factors as to what uh, happens going forward. So that would be that. And um, your question was about renewables getting cheaper, right? Yeah, why? I mean, I think it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm not, that kind of economist, uh, but I would say it, it's it's the 
uh, the scale of production. I mean, we've seen uh, Chinese solar PV uh, production ramp up, and we've seen costs go through the floor as a result of that, and, and, and indeed in Germany as well. Um, and I think uh, going forward, is that sustainable? Do you mean in terms of wh whether the cost reduction will, will stay, or, or do yes, you mean in terms of it destroying local businesses or destroying local production in the no, EU, I for meant, instance? I meant, I meant more from a sort of macro point of view. So it's a sustainable decision. <coughs> I think, yeah, I, I think it is the economies of scale, and I think it, it, I mean, from my simple viewpoint, I think it is sustainable. Yes, if, if, if sterling devalues, yes, we will see some... But I mean, it's one of many uncertainties, and we're looking at 2050, so, yeah. So, so move to this side, there's two questions, and then we'll, I will come back. So, please. Um, I have more than one question, I'll try to be brief. Uh, so, you could comment on how you involve... Uh, my name is Efrain Kamari, I'm a researcher. Uh, how do you involve demand side response for the flexibility of demand? The use of interconnectors, particularly in the uncertainty of how Europe will react. Uh, the contingencies of M minus one or M minus two if they are planning to carry out the enforcement. The cost of curtailment and the inertia <laughs> issues. When I haven't got a piece of paper to write a list. You You're going to have to take that through one at a time. Do well, well, so, yeah. Why don't you hold them and you can answer that? As briefly, and you can answer it later, also in the uh, in the drink. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get another question on the table as well. Hi, I'm Henry Ritz. I'm, I've also got a very long question um, <laughs> to do with whether you consider the research in the area of so geospatially. If you considered placing generation next to demand, based also on whether you know, high sun hours you know, in Cornwall, so a lot of solar in Cornwall, and a lot of wind in based in Scotland, but considering ideally place generation next to where the demand was, which would reduce constraints on the network and transmission losses and all of those factors, if you could use your models to estimate the cost savings of placing generation next to demand. I'll, I'll take that away. <laughs> what do you want now? I mean, uh, the model would have decided to do that if it was cost effective to do that. So um, the reason it doesn't deploy, uh, at least it doesn't deploy wind, for instance, near demand is because it's not windy. Um, and it's cheaper to build it, well, I mean, this is the thing, you're only looking at cost, there are, there are social implications, we haven't captured those around transmission line reinforcement, overhead pylons tend to annoy people, just like onshore wind tends to annoy people, so there's a question around that, but it, from a cost perspective, at the moment, it's cost effective to deploy away from demand, because the trans transmission is relatively cheap, um, at least in, in, in what we've done here. And we do not want the distribution grid, so that might change things also. We currently do not have demands or response in the model, but that's something we want to do. We have this very simplified representation of the interconnection, but um, we actually have a project next year where we're extending this model um, for the rest of Europe. So then trans interconnection will, will be one of the key issues we're going to look at. Um, the and and minus one. That's your <laughs> Uh, curtailment cost, there's no curtailment cost, so the model can just turn renewables off if it wants. And then inertia, um, I mean, this, this is not a unit commitment model, so it's just linear. It, uh, to get, we, we should probably handle the speci specifics of this, but it, it, it doesn't handle um, spinning reserve, for instance. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that we could consider adding. One of the issues around when you start capturing those, some of those uh, constraints is it tends to make the model a lot longer running and we like to run the model I mean if it was 50 or uh, 100 runs in some of the stuff that you've seen here uh, that that tends to speed things up and it's it's you know so we had a simplified representation of those sorts of things like a capacity margin we had a simplified representation of that so we could do more detailed modeling questions um, afterwards mm -hmm. in the drink uh, two people waiting uh, it was Adam and Miss Tiendo so please if you will get um, so Sort of touching on, on this question, um, it feels like the contingent, the, the sort of scenarios you've done on the supply side are uh, extremely thorough and interesting. Um, I mean, on the demand side, I guess there's obviously demand side response, there's a registration fee, and there's a registration transport. Do those, I mean, what have you done on those? Second one. So, so you're that one? 
Um, so very quickly, a uh, few questions. Um, were you able to, does, the, does the model not include the possibility of doing solo on rooftops? So is it only limited to a certain part of Stoke Martin? Okay. No. Um, and then but the battery storage locations in terms of the country. I was interested <coughs> by, it seemed to put a lot in London and just intuitively, it seems like a lot of battery storage projects aren't in London for a fellow appeal. Have you been able to map uh, where they've been done so far against where you think they should be and been able to feed in some uh, insight to that? Which one do you want? Okay. <laughs> uh, right, so demand. Um, so we take you um, demand from UKTM. So it tells us how much, what sectors can electrify it. Um, so it tells us um, we will have that many heat pumps, that many electric vehicles. But what we don't do at the moment, um, and the demand side is one thing that is still um, needs improvement, we do not actually change the, the profile of demand and based on um, electric vehicles. And that's the hourly profile. The hourly so, profile. So Times gives us the annual demand, mm -hmm. and then we take a national grid profile from the past, yeah. and we scale yeah. that up. Scale uh, but that means, of course, we don't incorporate charging patterns. Uh, that You know, you might get an EV charging pattern that, that alters that shape. You might get a heat pump pattern that alters that shape. Something that we definitely want to explore in the future. Now, solar farms. We do yeah. ground and roof mounted. Yeah. They're aggregated together, though. And your second question was around storage, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah that's a good question. It, in, in what we saw there, it, it, it seems to be that storage is being deployed next to demand. But that could be uh, influenced by costs. Um, and we haven't done a detailed analysis that yet, something that we'd like to do, to see whether, for instance, changing the cost of the transmission system, changing the cost of batteries, whether that then suddenly they get co-located with generation, which is, uh, you know, the literature, as far as I understand, is kind of uncertain about this. There's some signs indicating that batteries should be located with wind farms, for instance, in Scotland. But then um, I think it would be interesting to look at that in more detail. Yeah. Other questions? We have a question here and we have a question there. Um, I read, well, we'll take you next. Um, I'm not being sexist, but I've not seen any women raise their hand here. So but we'll, well, hopefully we'll, we will get some. But we have here and then the gentleman now. I suppose my question is more on the side of how is this study going to get used by policy? Because what you've essentially been doing is like a proposed planned economy approach, which is essentially planned economy and reduced for lowest cost output. But in reality, we don't do that if any of it's a real market economy. We don't choose where people bought power. Someone put solar panels in their fields because they get power commission and it's of you know um, economic yep. benefit to them. They make profit. So how is how do you, how do you essentially integrate? The information you've got here, but if there's some this idealized scenario with the yeah, actual market. So, on that one, and this uh, to, to study the, the price of the uh, battery storage or gas or the, you know, the, the battery storage and gas, mainly, uh, did you base the price of the models uh, on current prices or did you use uh, forecasts? For, you mean for the technology capacity? Uh, the for, for, for modeling, for modeling the yeah, yeah. The so, so the costs uh, essentially UKTM um, it has a database of costs, and they've come from uh, some consultancy work that's been done over the last few years. And what we've done is we've taken those costs and we've used those in high res, and they have cost estimates of what we think, for instance, gas generation with CCS will cost into 2050. Um, it is important to know that there, there's there's quite a bit of uncertainty around that. So that's some, as I was just talking about now. Thinking about cost uncertainty is something that we're keen to do. But yeah, so the costs will come from some work where people have tried to estimate and project what the costs of capacity will be. In, in 2050. 2050. Yeah. And the central planning versus market forces question. I mean, UKTM uh, is used currently by the government, so they, they use that model for their policy making, partly. Um, but what we are trying with the one study, we actually want to capture more of these planning issues. So we are aware that a lot of the onshore wind is not going to be placed in the most cost of the location, but it's actually going to be placed where there will be planning permission. And onshore wind is basically at the moment not happening. And there's no <coughs> planning application. Or the planning commission have drastically fallen. We looked at that. It was, I don't remember, but there yeah. So that's something we want to, we want to increase the realism the model. Okay, so we have one question here. One question 
time. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, on like what kind of scale they were expecting the sort of fairly massive rule. So, um, and the other one was whether you considered whether actually that bit of nuclear doesn't actually ever get filled in. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Uh, I'm just Louis Wilkinson. Uh, I'm in the nuclear team at Hayes. I just, just, I think, began by showing the cost comparison of entropy and most recent CFD orbits for offshore wind. Do you think you would be able to put an estimated value on um, reliability of the nuclear? From what, uh, you, from what you've seen? Compared to intermittency? Yeah, mean? compared to that. Or cost on intermittency. On intermittency. Yeah, so, so you mean basically to compare things on a like-for-like -like level, because yeah. nuclear is fairly reliable. Yeah. Uh, it's got a, a, an availability factor of 0.9 or whatever, and, and uh, wind is less reliable. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, we could. We haven't, but we could. Um, and I guess the model is implicitly doing that um, mm -hmm. when it's comparing between technologies, because in this case, if it picks wind, it also knows it has to potentially deploy mm -hmm. some, some gas some or gas storage, or mm -hmm. storage to cover that. So, but yeah, yeah. So that's it's done implicitly. We, we haven't looked at that in detail, but but we could do. We haven't put the value on it, but it's done by the model. Mm. And I've already forgotten what the second question so was. I guess mine was like, what are the what are the assumptions for heating That's a good question. Yeah. So um, we could get them, but we don't have them. I, I I don't have them off the top of my head. I mean, you can think about it. That's why we put the the total. Um, energy, uh, final energy consumption in 2016 was 1,600 terawatt hours. And we're talking about, in, at least in the Nexus study, we're talking about electricity demand of about 600 terawatt hours. So it's just a bit over a third of total um, energy consumption is electrified. Now, uh, yeah, I, I could get the numbers for you, but I don't know them off the top of my head. And there was a second question, wasn't there? Um, Yeah, it's a good question. No, we didn't explore that. I, I, I guess because the assumption was since they're already doing things at the Hinkley site, that it would find. But, but it's low capacity, only 3.2 gigawatts. So yeah, yeah. But, I mean, sure. you could take that as an indication of what happens if nuclear doesn't, if mm -hmm. Hinkley C doesn't happen. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Can sure. we see what the 1600 total towers is? Is it primary energy? As final energy primary. consumption. So that's after you've taken your primary energy, you've converted it into the stuff that you want it to be, and then that's your final energy consumption. And it's industry, and it's transport, and it's domestic, and it's uh, the services sector. In every form, not just electricity. Yeah. Shall we have a final um, set of questions? Um, see Daniel. Um, I, was, I, I, was, I, was, I was just, well, even though you asked the first question, we'll also give you the last question, because we're saying thank you. So Daniel. Hi, thanks. Yeah. Um, so that was a very important point, kind of the advice on uh, European projects like that. From your experience of more than just more than the HGP, was it how many were the years it's possible to get the model to have kind of like a system that would be black on the We haven't looked at that. No. Okay. How many jets you use in the ten. end? Ten. Each ten. Yeah. And that final question? Given the size of Tiger Resource and its predictability, would it be worthwhile incorporating? I uh, sure, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, but but it is unfortunately mediated by the cost of accessing that resource, um, because you know, for instance, if you can build offshore wind at sixty-ish pounds per megawatt hour, but tidal costs one hundred and fifty or whatever the, I mean, they were talking about strike prices similar-ish to Hinkley, and maybe even higher than that. It was a few years ago. Uh, and that's the tidal lagoons. Um, then, yeah, you, you you have to think about those costs balance. But uh, but I agree with you. If 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 tidal lagoons can get the kind of support, um, and and the costs can come down, and they don't have the environmental impact that's too large, then I, I think that they would introduce a nice uh, technology to mix. Because that, in that, that study that, that, that we actually published, um, we assumed that the costs are going to really they reduce dramatically. I don't remember what, and then we could see clear benefits from. From predictability. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Yeah. But costs need to come down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We came in with the tide, and we're, <laughs> we're going out with the tide. So. Um, please um, uh, uh, stay if you can and join us upstairs for something to eat and something to drink. You can ask uh, James and Marianne any other questions, even get a chance to ask. Or
please join me in thanking them both for such an interesting